Good evening. Last month's programme drew some of the best response in Crime Watch history. It was a time, of course, of tremendous public passion over the murder of the two-year-old in Walton, James Bulger. Until the guilt or innocence has been established of those now charged with the offence, there's obviously not a great deal that we can reveal at the moment. But it is now a matter of public record that two boys named by several Crime Watch viewers were being questioned by police before the programme went on air. In fact, many people were being questioned. These were all routine inquiries, and detectives had no clear evidence or even strong suspicions against any individuals. But then two boys were re-interviewed after new information came in from viewers, and murder charges followed. Detective Superintendent Albert Kirby, leading the inquiry, says it would have taken months of conventional police work to assemble the information that came in from Crime Watch callers, and he's asked us to pass on his thanks to everyone who rang. Our first case tonight is the murder of a 76-year-old man, killed for the sake of just a few pounds in takings at the pet shop where he worked. Arthur Broomhill had lived in Northampton all his life, and our reconstruction goes back exactly eight weeks to January the 21st. Arthur had worked at Denton's Pet Shop in Wellingborough Road for the past 11 years. Yeah. He's a good boy, aren't you, eh? Since his retirement from running his own business, he'd made his love of animals the centre of his life. Nice to see your friend. There you are. Good boy. Night night. He thrived on the contact with people too, and almost everyone in the neighbourhood knew and liked him. Well, my father was a wonderfully kind person, very gentle, quietly spoken, but a great sense of humour. We've had some very moving letters from children saying how much they loved him and how they'd bought their pets from him. Obviously, it was such a great shock to my mother and myself and the rest of the family, and we're coping. Um, but we are in a sort of limbo, simply because until the person that did this is caught, we can't have a funeral, and we're just, we're just about coping, but it's very difficult. Thursday, the 21st of January, the day Arthur died. He'd been in charge of the shop for a fortnight while the owners were away. I've got your orders for you. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. There you are. How much do I owe you? Uh, £3.80. I've known Arthur for about four years, and he was a lovely man, very friendly, very helpful, and we always had a chat. Very busy, yes. Have you? Well, the Dentons have been away, you see, so oh, have they? I've been here all on my own, working late at night. When he told me he'd been staying late, cashing up, I must admit I was very concerned. No, 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 no. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's now 5.30. Hello there. Oh, are you still open? Yes, you're in luck. I was just closing. Oh, good. Have you got any guinea pigs? Yes, come in and have a look. Now, this is a very friendly one. Very docile. Is it male or female? To be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> well, I like that one. I like that. It's a really nice one. Yeah, Jolly like good. That. I'll put it in a box for you. Well, good night then. Bye then. Good night. Four hours later, Arthur was still there. I was on my way home and I take the same route every night going down the Wellingborough Road. The time was somewhere between half past nine, twenty to ten. And as I went past the pet shop, I noticed the lights was on. I saw two people in there. One was the shopkeeper, and it looked as if the other person was a friend or somebody that he knew. This is the last time Arthur is known to have been seen alive. At about 20 past 10, round the corner from the shop, this woman was arriving home after an evening out. As I walked across towards my house, I saw a man hanging about by Stone Wright Memorials, and he looked really suspicious, and I sensed that he was watching me. He knew that I'd seen him. I, I actually had eye-to-eye -eye contact with him. And after that, I sensed that he watched me all the way to the door. And as I got to my door, I looked back once more, and he was still watching me. Between five and ten minutes later, I looked out of my front door and the man had gone. 
Early the next morning, another man drew the attention of several local people. I was on the Wellingborough Road, which is right opposite the pet shop, and I happened to notice this chap on the corner, and he seemed to be acting very suspiciously. He was just peering round the Wellingborough Road as if he didn't want to be seen. It made me think that he was up to no good. 20 minutes later, a couple of streets away... I was going down to get my newspaper, I could do every morning. It's about a couple of minutes' walk down to the shop and back. When I see him, I thought he was coming out to get a bus, and then he suddenly turned round and went back. I sort of didn't take a lot of notice of him the first time. I carried on down the road further to the next junction, and I see the same chap. And he was throwing something, which I thought was rather peculiar. I just carried on and uh, went and got my paper, and when I came out, he was there again. I, you know, I looked straight at him. He got blood down the front of his back suit. At half past eight, the assistant arrived at the shop to start work. Morning, Arthur. He found Arthur's body. He'd received several heavy blows to the head. Oh, Bob Thorogood, you do know what the murder weapon was? Yes, it was a tyre lever exactly like this one. One like that is missing from the shop. The man in the yellow tracksuit was seen throwing something. Could that have been what it was he was throwing? Yes, it could. It was about the same length. Um, and although where he threw it, the rubbish was cleared away, it may be that someone's taken it home. I do need to recover that quickly. Whatever it was, even if it wasn't a tyre lever, if you saw it, please give us a ring. What description do you have exactly of the man in the yellow tracksuit? Well, he was in his mid-thirties. He was about six feet tall with blonde hair, and on the morning he looked quite dishevelled. And what about the, the other man in yellow seen the night before, the, the night that Arthur died? Yes, of course, that was a very different yellow jacket. It was like a road worker's fluorescent jacket. And he was in his early 30s, about 5 feet 10, with short dark hair. But he was clearly a different man from the other one. You're convinced of that. What about the description of the man seen in the shop with Arthur shortly before he died? He was in his late teens, about 5 feet 5, with mousy brown hair. And there's, there'd been no forced entry into the shop? No, that's right, there hadn't, and we believe from that that Arthur may have let the person in. But there was a window open upstairs, and on the outside, on the window sill, was a boot mark like that, a very distinctive sole. And that was the one uh, going out? It looked as if it was out. someone going out of the shop, yes. And you've received two mysterious letters. Yes, I'm most anxious to speak to whoever wrote those letters. If you recognise either of those letters, please um, get in contact again. In fact, any detail you can give to Mr Thorough could, could be vital. If you saw anything that Thursday night, it was the 21st of January, or if you know of any possible reason why anyone would want to kill Mr Broomhill, please ring. The number here is 081 811 8181, or you can ring the Northampton Police Headquarters on 0604 700 700. That's 0604, the code for Northampton, 700 700. Last month's reconstructions haven't led to arrests so far, although police are hopeful of finding the gunman who crippled a security guard. That was an abortive raid on a delivery van in Doncaster. Almost 250 viewers rang to help solve that one. And a promising response from Photocall. Two good leads on one man, though we can't say much about it. The three others here are still being sought. Let's see if we can do rather better tonight. Here with this month's gallery of faces are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Do you recognise this man? Police from three forces would like to speak to him about a series of robberies at banks and building societies. Since April of last year, 17 attacks have taken place in Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire and Derbyshire. Here he is at the Woolwich Building Society in Loughborough on the 2nd of July. On the 10th of August, he went to the Midland Bank at Shepshed, Leicestershire, where, saying he had a gun, he demanded money. These last photographs were taken at Barclays Bank in Stapleford on February the 10th. He's in his late 30s or early 40s, about 5 foot 9, and favours wearing an olive green cagoule. If you know who he is or where he is now, please call. If you're a car dealer in the Midlands, you might have come across Peter Reynolds. We'd like to speak to him in connection with a series of car deceptions. Throughout 1991, he operated a company called Alpha Cars in Marjorie Street, Leicester. In April of that year, several expensive vehicles were obtained fraudulently and then subsequently sold on for cash. 
These three cars are still outstanding and may now be in the hands of innocent buyers. A beige Mitsubishi Shogun, registration H343AMT, a grey Toyota Supra Turbo, H48GJU, and a black Lincoln Continental, SXI4567. Mr. Reynolds is 44 and 5 foot 10. He has several tattoos, including a crucifix on his left thumb and love on his right hand fingers. He may be using the alias Edward Barr Macmillan. If you've seen him or know where the cars are, please call us tonight. If you recognise this man, you could help solve a robbery at a jeweller's in Leicester City Centre two months ago. Just after 4pm on the 7th of January, he and three accomplices asked to see some jewellery which was on display. As the assistant opened the cabinet, the robbers grabbed a tray of rings and bracelets. The man's described about 24, 5 foot 7, medium to stocky build with a local accent. His accomplices are in their 20s, slightly taller and wearing dark jackets. If you can help, call us now. Do you know who this man is? We believe he may have information about an employment agency which offered construction work abroad. Calling itself Orion Associates and operating from an address in Wembley, Middlesex, the company advertised jobs in the national press. Since July, several hundred people have replied to the ads and sent in a £15 registration fee. They've heard nothing since. On July the 15th, this man was caught on the security camera at the Halifax Building Society in Edgware, North London. He obtained cash from an account believed to be holding the proceeds of the job advertisements. He's in his 30s, about 6 foot and well built with mid-brown hair. If you do know who he is, or can help with any of our other photo call faces, please ring us tonight. And the lines are open now, 081-811-8181. 81 we always try to make our reconstructions completely accurate, of course. Authentic locations, the actual witnesses instead of actors wherever possible, and, of course, the precise sequence of events. Our next case, though, is one where we've deliberately changed some of the details. The points of appeal are real enough, of course, but several other elements have either been altered to obscure copycat offences. The crime wasn't as straightforward as the film makes it appear, and, indeed, it was nearly foiled. Saturday the 13th of February and this Toyota Celica was stolen from Hayford Manor Hotel in Northampton. Four days later and 50 miles away in Sutton Coldfield. John Moody was a regular night driver with Lightning Dispatch, a parcel and package courier service. I'm uh, never aware of what goods I carry, mostly low-value stuff. But occasionally we do get uh, TVs and videos and electrical appliances. Let's see, John. Let's see, guys. John had been driving since 5.30 the previous afternoon, and this was his last load of the night, going home to Manchester, north on the M6. Driving at night can be a lonely job. It's not too bad if you have a radio. But on this particular night, there wasn't one. So you've only got your thoughts to think about, your family and how they are, and how you'd be glad to get back to them the next morning. Just after Junction 13, two tipper trucks from a company called Bulk Freight were travelling behind John's lorry. Both drivers had CB radios. So we don't get paid for that? You must be joking. I was talking to my friend Tony on the CB. It helps to pass the time on our journeys. Usually his rude comments about the other drivers on the road, how, you know, how they drive and everything else. Hey, Tony, look at this idiot. I don't know, mate. He wants his head examined. At first, I thought it was kids messing about, but with a fast car like a Toyota, I thought it would have gone in the fast lane and shot off. But uh, then it looked as though it was using us as cover. I was running early, 
and I'd passed the uh, 10 mile marker for the keel services, so I was looking forward to having an early finish. But then John saw flashing lights. This is one scene where we've disguised some of the details. There's cars behind it all the time, you know, you don't take all that much notice of them, there's plenty on the motorway. But uh, when he asked me to pull in, um, I obviously thought there was something wrong at the back, that probably the back doors had come open. Maybe the back lights was out. Anything could be wrong, you know. You can't see at the back, obviously, when it's dark. Get out! Out of sight! Just get down and no one gets hurt! She had terror, I froze. It's the thought of not knowing what's going to happen to you. And, uh, it's a terrible feeling. I couldn't begin to describe to you what my feelings was, really. It's, I just thought, this is it. Goodbye, John. Hey, Derek, that Toyota is pulled in the bloody lorry. Can you phone the police? I think it's an hijack. Ah, uh, Roger there, mate. K789, PK and Roger. I got that, mate. Although it was dark in the boot of the car, I, I could still manage to see the street lights overhead. And then it went dark, and I knew it was out in the country somewhere, and I could hear the grit flying up underneath the car. Well, after the car stopped, uh, I had cramp in my legs and needed to go to the toilet. The wireless went on quite loud. After a while, it just do your head in. But a short time after, I, I heard my truck pull up. I all this clattering and banging going on. And the radio had been playing loud for quite a while. And uh, eventually, I heard the two doors slam and drove off. After a while we stopped at a petrol station because I could see the Flying Horse logo above. We know the garage was here at Hagley Road in Hales Owen, 40 miles from where John had been abducted. The practice here, as in many garages, is to jot down all car registration numbers. The attendant remembers the man being tall, of stocky build, and between 25 and 30 years. Come on out. I had great difficulty to get out because my legs were cramped up pins and needles. Um, go on, you can go. I thought, okay. Now what, is this it? Well, I just stood there, bewildered, terribly grateful that I was still alive, because I didn't think I would be. But uh, I did see the lights in the distance, so I thought my best bet was to walk towards them, which I did. About an hour later, this witness was driving towards Hales Owen. I was travelling from Birmingham to Kidderminster. I passed the vehicle around about 10 to 7. I recognise the vehicle the vehicle because of its logo. I do know of that particular company. It seemed strange for the vehicle to be parked at that time of the morning. There was very little traffic about. I walked down this country lane, which seemed a hell of a long way. Um, apparently from, from there to the telephone box was three miles, but it seemed like 30. I'm still off work and I can't return to work uh, through the uh, experience I've had. Um, some days I'm OK and then the next day I'm, something triggers it off and I'm, I'm back to oh, I'm back to square one again. You know. Five days later that Toyota was abandoned on a farmer's field in Bishop's Itchington in Leamington Spa and it's that Toyota that really is one of the, the key elements in this. You need, to, you need to find where it was. I do, yes. This is an ele elegant, stylish car that enthusiasts would notice. And uh, I feel sure that someone, somewhere, has seen that car during the time that it was missing. K789 PKM, uh, and it's been missing from Saturday the 13th of February, 
from uh, Northampton to the 22nd of February when it was uh, rediscovered. We've got an artist impression of one of the guys, the chap who, who bought petrol at the garage. Describe what, what you know of him. Yes, he is 5 feet 10 inches to 6 feet tall. He's uh, of stocky build and um, has uh, dark hair. He's 25 to 30 years. And again, if anyone feels that they know this man, then I would ask that they contact us urgently. Now, you bought some of the equivalent with you of what was stolen, <laughs> much of it absolutely useless to the, to the robbers. These are printed circuit boards, but they're only applicable to one type of machine, I think. That is correct. They are totally useless uh, to anyone else. And I feel sure, again, that someone may find these abandoned somewhere. Whether it's one or more than one, please let us know. OK, so if you've seen PCBs, printed circuit boards, and they're all fairly chunky ones, uh, for heaven's sake, please let us know or call your local police. Some of the things that were stolen, though, could be resold. Now, describe those to them, the particular the unique ones. Yes, there's about 90 uh, in total of the um, uh, fax machines, two of which are prototypes, and we have the serial numbers of all these. So, again, if someone has recently purchased, uh, perhaps at a reduced price, Please get in touch with us. We if can compare it with our reg uh, serial numbers. OK, have you seen fax machines like these? SF505 or SF500? Because if you have, the only thing they could have come from is this robbery. The number here in the studio is 081-811-8181. Or you can call the police direct in Stafford on 0785-234-938. That's 0785, the code for Stafford, 234-938. Well, now, more appeals for your help on cases all over the country. At the incident desk, as usual, are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Sexual attacks on women by complete strangers are thankfully very rare. But nonetheless, when they do happen, as in our next case, the ordeal can destroy part of a person's life. This case is no exception, and though the victim appears in our reconstruction, she's asked us not to use her real name. The events took place in Rochdale, Lancashire. I started running about 15 years ago after I'd had pleurisy. Um, having two children, I didn't think that I'd really, you know, be that good at running. But I've won quite a lot of trophies, and um, for my age group, I'm probably ranked about fifth in the country for distance running. Oh, heck, that was a bit rubbish. At the oh, Rochdale no, Golf Club, so two members were taking part in a ladies' competition. We've been members for about 15 years. Um, we play most Thursdays, and that particular Thursday, it was the monthly medal. As I went to play my second shot, this man came out on a mountain bike, and as I approached him, he stopped. I would say he was with anything between 18 and 25, reasonably well built, but not fat. We didn't think anything about it because when I turned round, he'd gone back onto the footpath. Later that afternoon, Suzanne was starting a nine-mile run. I was training for the London Marathon. I like to do at least two hours a day training. I remember the time as I was going onto the golf course, as I was doing a particular session, which I had to time, and it was just past three o'clock. There's that uh, on the 5th. We saw the same man again. He came out of a side footpath and stopped and stared at us and watched us play on. Oh, good shot. I heard a bike coming up from behind me and I turned round and I saw a man approaching me very fast on a mountain bike. I immediately knew that something was going to happen, be it woman's intuition, whatever. Ah! He had both hands over my mouth, very hard, and I just couldn't breathe at all. I felt I was being suffocated and I was going to die there and then. I really thought I was going to die. He eventually released his hands, if I promised not to shout anymore, and started to walk me over towards the wall. And at this point, he seemed concerned about his mountain bike. I tried then to make another escape, but he caught me and gave me a blow to the side of my head. And it went on from there. 
Stephen Royal had been a member of the golf club for just one week. I noticed the bike just lying on the ground, so I went over to have a look at it. I thought it was unusual for the bike to be there. And as I looked up, I saw a man staring at me from the other side of the bank. And then a lady appeared. I was stunned. I didn't really know what was going on. I saw the golfer, it was as though it was a miracle, because there was nobody else around at all earlier on. It was, just, it was as though he just uh, appeared from heaven. And the man that had attacked me tried to retrieve his bike, but he ran off towards some trees and bushes. My life has been turned upside down. It won't ever be the same again. I've lost all my independence and my confidence. And I certainly won't be able to go out running again on my own. I have to rely on people to come with me. Um, it happened in broad daylight, which makes it ten times worse. Could have been a schoolgirl coming home from school if it had happened half an hour later. This man said to me he was a desperate man and he's got to be caught before he does this or something worse to somebody else. This is her attacker. He's between 20 and 30, around 5 foot 9 with quite a solid build. His hair was very short, light brown, and he wore a blue bomber jacket with bleached jeans. And this is the bike he left behind. It's a Marin Muirwood's mountain bike, although the logo has been taken off. It's less than a year old and has a 20 and a half inch frame, built for someone over 6 foot, although the seat has been adjusted to suit a smaller person. The accessories could have been added, the Mount Zephyr luminous pump, the Shimano brake pads and the black Onza bar with has insulating tape on the ends. If you recognise it or can identify the man, please call the incident room in Rochdale on 061 856 8550. That's 061, the code for Manchester, 856 8550. A family weekend in Edinburgh turned to tragedy for 20-year-old Paul Sheldon. Paul was an art student and had gone out on Friday evening the 6th of February for a few drinks with his brother and a friend. In the early hours of Saturday morning, they were making their way home along White House Lone in the Brunsfield area of the city when they were confronted by these two men. A scuffle broke out and after a chase, Paul was stabbed to death. This is the man with the knife. He's between 18 and 20, about 5 foot 9, with deep sunken eyes and possibly wearing a woolen ski hat, a sweatshirt and baggy jeans. The other man was a little older, 20 to 22, 6 foot, well built with black hair. If you recognise either of these men, or can help in any way, you can call Lothian and Borders Police Headquarters in Fetis Avenue on 031 311 3535. That's 031, the code for Edinburgh, 311-3535. Police in David Powers need your help to find these youths who attacked and robbed two elderly sisters. At around 2pm on Thursday the 4th of February, the men tricked their way into the sisters' home in the Swansea Valley. They took cash and jewellery before escaping on foot. Two hours later, at around 4.15 in Ustradoin, two and a half miles away, a taxi driver recalls taking the youth to Swansea Town Centre. Do you know where they went from here? This man's about 17, between 5 foot 5 and 5 foot 7, with short dark hair and an Irish accent. His accomplice is older, in his early 20s and about 6 foot tall. They left these items of clothing about 500 yards from the scene. A suede jacket, which has Adler on the label inside. These two sweatshirts, one's a Smithy International and the other a Stamp Classics. And this pair of woolen gloves. If you recognise any of them or know who the men are, please ring the Dufford Powers Police on 0267 221 212. That's 0267, the code for Carmarthen, 221 212. This all-terrain go-kart is one of only 25 in the country and three of them have been stolen from Hatchwood Leisure Karting in Bedfordshire. 
It happened when thieves broke into the steel container where the carts were stored. They drove them off across fields towards the A1. At about 3am on Thursday the 21st of January, two of the carts were seen being driven here in a lay-by near the Windsock filling station on the northbound carriageway of the A1. It's thought then they were loaded onto another vehicle and driven away. They're very distinctive, bright red and bearing these serial numbers. Two of them were Gemini Dominators, like this one. The other, very similar but an earlier model, is a Gemini Voyager. If you have any information, you can call the incident room in Bedford on 0234 841 212. That's 0234, the code for Bedford, 841 212. And of course, you can always ring direct to the studio here, 081-811-8181. That's 081-811-8181. Just having a look at some of the calls that are coming through. It's been fairly disappointing so far on Arthur Broomhill, although somebody's run to say that the yellow tracksuit could well be a local dispatch rider's uniform. <laughs> but we've had good calls on all the photo call cases. The Peter Reynolds, we've had calls on all the missing cars and an interesting call on that. Building Society robber in the Midlands, somebody's added some useful information there. And the jewellery robbery, a viewer has offered a name and police are investigating that. People who commit serious crimes say they can only behave as they do by blocking out all thoughts about their victims. If only it was as easy for victims to blank out things they'd like to forget. In our next case, two men looking for quick money traumatised the lives of others and maybe accidentally almost killed someone. This is Spencer's Wood, four miles outside Reading in Berkshire. Morning, Good morning, Tilly. Good morning, Tony. Anything Peggy. exciting to report? No, no nothing. Uh, Just putting the Christmas cards. Oh, uh, well, I'll leave you to it. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Yes. Bye bye. Okay, I'll come give you a hand. We've lived in Spencer's Wood for the past 22 years. It has a real village feel to it. And because we've been here so long, we know everyone and everyone knows us. I did want to go and do some Christmas shopping. I haven't done anything. I haven't got anything. Back in mid-November, a villager may have seen the robbery being planned. I work at the bakery in Spencer's Wood, about four doors down the road from the post office. I was leaving work about half past nine in the morning and I noticed uh, across the road there was a white car parked in the industrial estate. Normally people would, would park on the side of the road, not in the industrial park. Um, so that sort of caught my attention. The following week, three days before the robbery, but 40 miles away in Twickenham, West London. I thought I'd go out for a breath of fresh air, and whilst out there, I decided to check my car was locked OK, and saw a couple of guys um, walking along the street that looked unfamiliar and a bit suspicious as well. Well, I was in two minds as to whether or not I should actually report them to the police. And when I got indoors, I just thought I'd give them a ring. Before police arrived, this student, a Frenchman, went to get his car from the college car park where the two men had been seen. Make a sound and I'll kill you. £347, 50p. Next day, now two days before the robbery. Oh, I'll go. Can I help you? Well, I don't know what it was about him, but I felt something wasn't quite right. I can only cash two of these. The other two you'll have to cash at your local post office. Okay, that's all right. Thirty-four ninety. Thank you. Thank you. 
There was something about him that made me feel rather uneasy. Now the robbery itself, late Thursday afternoon in the last week of November. I'm off to Reading now to do my late night Christmas shopping. OK. Are you going to be long? No, shouldn't be too long. OK. See you later. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. I would have been absolutely horrified if I'd realised what was going on. I felt very guilty when I got home that I hadn't been home to support him. Is that everything? Yeah, that's everything. I was going to the post office to buy some stamps for my Christmas cards. seeing two men coming out carrying a, a sawn-off shotgun. I was extremely worried what I was going to find in the post office. Oh, my God, are you all right? Mm. Yeah, yes, there's been a robbery at Spencerwood Post Office. I've got the yeah. registration number. Oh, well, well done. Uh, the car registration number is MJD522X. Yeah, two men, one of them armed. Within three quarters of an hour, and just three quarters of a mile away, the car was found abandoned on a farm track. The offside front had been damaged in the three days since the BMW had been stolen. It was much later that I found out the shotgun had been fired, and I suddenly realised that the pellets must have missed me by a couple of inches. I was very shaken. Slim. It's just such a shame that we've been here all these years and this should happen just as we're about to retire. Adrian Bex, we do at least have artist impressions of both of the attackers and they, they seem to be fairly similar in appearance. They are. The gunman is a man aged in his late 20s, early 30s, slim build. He had an unusual black leather jacket with a graphical design of some sort covering the whole of the back. Some Chinese looking design by the, by the looks of it. The other man, the one in the brown jacket? Very similar description. The only difference uh, between him and the gunman, he had some facial stubble. <laughs> The car itself, it was an old shape uh, BMW 3 Series, as you can see the number there, MJD 522X. That was stolen on the 23rd of November, it wasn't recovered for three days. That's right. Uh, we'd like to know where that car was in the meantime. Uh, in between the time of the theft and the recovery, shortly after the robbery, it, it had some offside damage caused. We'd like to know how that damage was caused. You don't know if it was struck by another car or whether it was... An impact with a, We've no a idea how it was caused. If anyone can help us with that, we'd like to hear from you. And them. the area, probably West London or down the M4 towards Reading? Quite possibly. OK. You've uh, brought some water filters with you. These are uh, NSA water filters, sort of things that normally sold in people's homes. And there might be thousands of people who've had these offered to them. But seven of these are missing from, from the boot of the car. They went from the boot of the car. If anyone can help us with those in any association uh, with men of the description that's been given, we'd like to hear but from them. only if you can link them with some other clue, otherwise we'll get thousands of calls, <laughs> please. And we've got one other description of one other man. We have. There was a man that went into the post office two days before right. trying to sell some stolen child uh, benefit vouchers. He was uh, aged in his late teens, early 20s. If anyone can help us uh, with identifying that man, we'd like to hear from them. And you're not really interested in prosecuting him for the, for the vouchers, providing you can eliminate him? We'd like him to come forward and, uh, so that we can eliminate him. The number here in the studio, 081 811 or you can call Reading Police Station Direct on 0734 599915. That's 0734, the code for Reading, 599915. And now, this extraordinary haul of weapons was retrieved after a series of raids by police in London last September. Between them, these guns might be linked to more than 100 armed robberies and an attempted murder. Now, to prove those links, police need your help to discover where these weapons came from originally and whose hands they passed through since they left their rightful owners. Some of them are really quite unusual. 
And with us is David Penn from the Imperial War Museum. David, can we have a closer look at some of the rarer ones? This is perhaps the most unusual gun here. It's an American Folsom Arms Company from New York. Made about the turn of the century, a 12-bore double-barrel gun could not have been legally sold in this country because it has fake British proof marks on it. The next gun is this Montenegrin Gasser revolver. This was made before the First World War in Belgium, but they were mainly sold in the Balkans. Every Montenegrin male had to carry a revolver by law. Lots of them were captured from the Turks in the First World War. This is probably uh, a war souvenir. These days, because of its calibre, it would be an antique. Next, we have this single-barreled Harrington and Richardson 12-bore shotgun, sawn off, as all the shotguns are here. This one was imported between 1925 and 1955, and while it's a very common type of farmer's gun, this particular gun has this very unusual aluminium spacer put in to take up slack between the stock and the action, and someone may remember that. Lastly, we have this Brazilian 22 calibre Rossi revolver, a target revolver. This was imported into this country legally in 1987, and the main feature of interest about it is these deep acid etchings. It's possible that this revolver at some point was in contact with a car battery. Well, David, thank you. If you think you recognise any of these weapons, you might be able to help clear up one of the biggest series of serious crimes in Britain since the war. So please do call if you can help. You can call the police direct on 071 230 2301 or the number here in the studio again, 081 811 8181. That's 081 811 8181. In all honesty, there's been such a response tonight, it's really hard to know which ones to pick out. On the M6 hijack, a really good response. Incidentally, there's a £5,000 reward on this one. Several names have been suggested for the man seen buying petrol. On photo call, there's a staggering response, especially to the job con man. Uh, on the Arthur Bromhill murder, the yellow tracksuit, there are more details on that. Now the officers are interested in anyone who owns a yellow tracksuit in the area. Rochdale, indecent assault, two names put forward on that. Really a great deal more, and it's still coming in. And that's just about all for tonight so far. We'll be in a better position to tell you what sort of calls and information have been coming in when we come back with the Crime Watch update. That'll be at 11.25. And finally tonight, the BBC has been in the news so much this week that we felt that we had to add another voice. But this time, on behalf of Noddy. Original artwork intended to be photographed for a future issue of the very important Noddy magazine has been stolen from BBC Enterprises in West London, not far from where I'm standing. The artwork dates back to the early 50s, and many illustrations were produced by Van Beek. That's the Dutch artist who created the original Noddy image. If you've seen them, the originals, that is, here's the number. We'll be back in half an hour from now. If you can't stay up till then, don't have nightmares. Not even about big ears. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.